Hi everyone and welcome to another out and about location. And today, just like the last video, is an impromptu one because the snow has finally fallen here in Haslinden. And I've been waiting for this uh, since we covered a story uh, middle of last year. And it was called The Charles Lane Misadventure. And this story takes place back in 1909. Uh, and it's a it's a sad tale in that it's uh, it's an incident that really it could have been avoided and yet It probably couldn't have been avoided at the same time if that makes sense Well, it hopefully will make sense as we go through the story, but yeah, we're here Yet again on Charles Lane and as many of uh, you guys who watch the videos may know that we've done quite a few videos in and around Haslingdon and Charles Lane always seems to be the epicenter of everything that took place back in the 1800s, early 1900s. And when I said everything that took place, anything that was kind of sad or dark, the stories that we've covered all seem to, or many of them seem to surround or involve Charles Lane at some point. But yeah, we're gonna tell you the story now of the Charles Lane misadventure. With much of the country blanketed under deep snow and underlying frost that had brought hundreds of mills and factories to a close with over 15,000 workers within East Lancashire alone all being left unable to work, for children it brought an unexpected break from their daily chores of not just work but also that of school. Many took to the parks and playing fields to enjoy the extended break, throwing snowballs, making snowmen and if they had the means they would find somewhere steep enough to enjoy the rare opportunity to sledge down. Charles Lane was still a hive of activity at this time, with reported 50 to 60 people still using the lane as the ideal coasting area for their sleighs, and amongst all those using the lane were 14-year-old Thomas Edwin Pickup and his friend 15-year-old Robinson Sagar. It was around 7.40pm by the time both of them had made their way back up towards Peel Street, the highest points that joined onto Charles Lane, and after adjusting his sleigh, Thomas placed himself towards the front, while his friend Robinson sat behind him. And with both boys ready, Thomas began to count down. Three, two, one. So at the same time as the two boys who were making the way down at the top of Charles Lane here, down at the bottom, two gentlemen were leaving work at Springvale Mill. One was James Roberts, and the one was a man by the name of Havelock Bond. Now, they both come out, they finished the shift, and James was lighting a cigarette or a pipe up down at the bottom. Now, that evening it was very foggy, they had gas lamps uh, and everything was a bit murky but like I said there was a lot of people who were using this lane to enjoy themselves have a bit of fun. So anyway, so uh, James and Havelock have come out down at the bottom and we'll take you to that place shortly. But whilst they were there they were um, lighting a pipe up. Now meanwhile like I said you had James down at the bottom and at the top you had Thomas and Robinson and they were coming down at some speed and especially when they hit this bend here. It was reported at the time that when they hit the bend, even from the top to here, they were doing up to like 15 miles per hour. So they were gaining speed and momentum all the time. So it's no surprise that when they get to the bottom, and as you can see, there's a curvature in the actual lane that takes, takes around to the right. Um, people coming up the lane obviously had to dodge out the way and move out the way because they didn't want to get hit by the sledges. And the sledges back in them days, they weren't the plastic ones of today. You know, they had the metal, um, runners if you will and they just had like a wooden plinth to sit on and it was only controlled by people using string at the end and obviously the feet to break so these these things could shift and they would go at some speed so you've got Havelock and you've got James at the bottom making the way up and you've got Robinson and Thomas making the way down so you can imagine where this story is now going to uh, take us making their way down the lane whizzing past children and adults alike they both laughed at the exhilarating speed they were most likely encountering, but unfortunately, their fun would soon turn into tragedy. Now if you look on the floor, people are still using the actual lane for sledging to this day. A man and his young son has just come down and you can see the actual sledge marks. So they're still using it today uh, for sledging, and like I said, it is a pretty steep incline, so I mean obviously the father with his son is obviously taking control of things and it's a little bit more safer and there's obviously nobody in the lane itself, but yeah, it's amazing uh, to think that these things still happen here 
and here where you've got the modern electric lamps this is where the gas lamps probably were at the time the old flickering gas lamps so nothing's really changed in what over 100 years uh, since the tragedy took place so as you had uh, Robinson and Thomas making the way down, careering down the lane like I keep saying there was uh, quite a few people playing here at the time um, but the bend as you can see on the right just round about there now that is where Havelock and uh, James were making the way around and apparently Thomas would say at the time that he could see the gentleman from the top of the lane as they were making their way down. Now they, they said they at the time could actually see two men walking around before they got there and they shouted to get out of the way. But I mean, just standing here, now I know there's a lot more trees here and I'll put a photograph over the top of this because obviously a lot of these weren't here at the time. But you only have to look down. And personally, I can't see how they could have seen them walking around unless they were at the bend. But we know they weren't directly in front. They were, they were further around and would take there shortly. But there's just no way, I honestly don't believe, they could have seen the two men walking around. But when it went to, uh, to, to the courts and the jury, this is what they said happened. As Thomas and uh, Robinson had made, made their way down Charles Lane, they've told and they've shouted out to people to move out of the way. You know, these two boys didn't go out intentionally to hurt anybody. They just wanted fun. And I said that at the top of Charles Lane. They just wanted some fun. Everybody else were out doing the same thing. Um, but as they've careered down and they've got to the bend, which we're going to be there shortly, that's when the collision took place with James. Now, Thomas had actually shouted just before he got there, within 15 feet, to jump out of the way. Now, Havelock Bond shouted over to Jim, hey, up Jim, and Havelock managed to get out of the way. But yet, James didn't have time. He was three foot away from the wall when the, um, when the sledge with the two boys came careering down. James Edward Berry, who was also a hard waste breaker at Springvale Mill and who had seen the collision quickly made his way over to where James Roberts was now lying unconscious on the ground. Several other people who had seen what had occurred also made their way over to offer their assistance and after a few minutes of deliberating on what to do, Havelock Bond and James Berry, between them both, would manage to carry James onto an adjoining house nearby and after attending to the injuries on his legs and head, they would carry him up to his home which was only situated a few minutes walk away over on nearby Prospect Hill. They arrived at James's house at around 8 o'clock, around 15 minutes after the accident, and after making him comfortable, Dr Stewart would be called for. For the next 24 hours or so, James Roberts would remain in a critical condition, and on Friday 6th of March and just before 7 o'clock that morning, he would sadly pass away from his injuries. He never regained consciousness. Now it's somewhere around here where we have a photograph of some children sat on a fence overlooking Springvale Mill, which is just there in front of us. But here, round about here, there was some gate posts, and it could well be here where the actual wall changes. But I'll superimpose a photo now, and you'll see what I mean about having no trees and how the boys, even though there's no trees, the wall is high, so I don't see how they could have seen James and Havelock walking around the bender, which is just here on our right hand side. So, one of these houses on our left is one that uh, James was taken into. That, uh, that evening uh, but like I said we just don't know which which it would have been and in front of us is Springvale Mill and this is where James left uh, that evening with Havelock Bond and just on our left you'll see the sign Charles Lane Right, so we'll take you to where the collision took place. And it is on a corner of a road known as Flip Road. And Flip Road, like I say, it's not the longest uh, road in the valley. But this is it, this is where uh, James sadly uh, was uh, knocked over that night. And now if I turn you around, you'll see the actual bend more now, and you can see it. You can see just as the bend now comes round down to here and it was round about where we stood now where the collision took place about three foot away from the wall so what probably be round about here somewhere round about here or just off the bend 
and we think this is where or we know this is where james was uh, hit that that mark well, that night and havelock jumped to the right out of the way now the two boys carried on going 15 yards further down this way uh, until they stopped now they didn't think much of it at the time obviously they knew they hit somebody but they didn't realize how bad it was but yeah that is where james was knocked over and never regained conscious uh, consciousness and sadly passed away just over 24 hours later so on monday the 9th of march the inquest into james robert's death took place at the hasland and town hall now it wasn't a long inquiry or inquest uh, and in fact it only took several hours now the two boys were questioned at the time asking did they know right from wrong and the boys said well you know they were like they were put on the spot saying things like well you know how do you mean so one of the actual prosecuting members of the jury turned around and they said well if a policeman came to you what do you do if you're doing something wrong and i think it was thomas who turned around and said we run away <laughs> you know and it's a weird answer to give so the um the prosecutor turned around and said i think it was called mr whitaker said so you actually do know right from wrong which puzzled thomas and uh, obviously robinson at the same time now what um what mr whitaker was trying to get at was if they know right from wrong and they know they're in trouble by the police and they know to run away then why were they using a sledge on charles lane when they knew it was illegal obviously they couldn't answer that they were i mean at the end of the day they were just two young boys having fun one with 14 one with 15. but uh yeah it seemed a very strange question to ask of thomas and uh, robinson but uh, i could kind of see where mr whitaker was going with his questioning so after a couple of hours of uh, deliberations and questioning the jury retired and then came back with a verdict of death by misadventure and i don't know if you can see me quite well in this light guys just going through uh, the old well it used to be the old railway tunnel it's now the motorway the a56 but yeah uh, the jury returned with the guilty of death by misadventure but they also the foreman of the jury also turned around and said that the boys really could only be punished severely with strong words James Roberts will be interred within the grounds of Haslandon St James Church on Tuesday 9th of March. He was just 50 years old and left behind not only his wife, Alice, but also that of his three children, Herbert, Annie and Edith. The people of Haslandon and neighbouring villages would all come together to raise funds set up by the Haslandon Wheelers Club to help his family during their time of need, with many workers from most, if not all, of the mills in the vicinity, all donating what they could afford at the time. Mr Thomas Baxendale, Secretary, would list details of those individuals as well as mills and factories that had kindly donated to the cause, and in total a grand sum of £71.19 and shillings were collected. Now interestingly, on Saturday 13th of March, one of the local newspapers ran a report about this story, and basically it was to remind parents of their responsibilities, like we just touched upon, about obviously the parents of Robinson and Thomas both being implicated in um james's death saying that obviously you know that parents should be influencing the children for the better so like i said not purchasing items that could be used in a dangerous way such as a sleigh um it was, it was quite a condemning report to be honest um and it also brought into question the actions of the parents themselves you know it said that it states the obvious that a toboggan is not the kind of thing a child can come into possession quite easily and without the knowledge of his or her parents so yeah it was quite a condemning uh, report now another interesting uh, thing that came out of this uh, tragedy was the foreman of the jury actually re requested the court to make sure that the corporation so the lancashire rosendale or whatever they had to throw ashes down on ice and snow when it started to fall and, and was so severe because not only did it obviously lead to the tragic death of an innocent man but also it brought the entire network the entire east lancashire to a standstill so changes actually did occur and come out of this tragedy and changes for the good 
So when we were just mentioning this story about obviously this snow brought most of East Lancs to a standstill, even today with modern technology, modern cars, you can see it. These cars here that have all been just left here, we've got a tractor or snow player on it coming past. Uh, but yeah, even today, snow brings so much havoc to these small towns and villages that we all live in. It's, it's incredible that over a hundred years later and we still cannot deal with the conditions. Now, if you like this video, this is only a short one, uh, but if you did like this video, and I'm gonna interrupt myself again, but it's a short one simply because the snow has fallen today and it meant for the, you know, the perfect setting. But if you did like this story, don't forget to give us a like, comment, subscribe, comment down below. You know, should the kids have been uh, punished more severely? Should the parents have been punished perhaps? Just let me know what you thought, like I said, comment down below. But in the meantime, from this snowy location, take care and look after yourselves. I go. And Vicky's just brought me umbrella.